Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 3. I got love on my mind. What can I say? I got love on my mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to be studying verses 1 through 9. And the title of the message this morning is, When Spiritual Growth is Stunned. When Spiritual Growth is Stunned. <coughs> the, th- this whole letter, you know, we've already re- we've, we've, uh, talked about this before, but, you know, it's important to rehash, is that this letter is to correct the immaturity of the, of the Corinth church, because that's what it boils down to. They were very immature. And we're going to look at some of the keys to what brings about immaturity. So that way it's a warning for us as well that, you know, we can't just say, oh, yeah, look, look at the Corinth church. You read the two letters and you go, oh, my gosh, bunch of immature Christians, so on and so forth, and almost exclude yourself from that. Listen, we're, we're right in there. Because one day, I mean, think about this. Look at Peter. When, when the Lord was saying, who do they say that I am? And they said, some say this, some say that, right? The prophet and all this other stuff. And then, and, then, and then Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter has this epiphany from heaven. He says, well, you're Mashiach Adonai, right? You're the Savior. You're Messiah. And Jesus says, that Peter came from heaven. And so right there he had like this, like this awesome spiritual wisdom that came upon him. Jesus identified where it came from. It didn't come from within. It didn't come in his own flesh. It didn't come from his own know-how. It came and inspired from heaven. And then in that same breath later on, as Jesus talks about, yeah, that's true, right on. And by the way, I'm going to be handed over to the enemies. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die a horrible death. And then Peter says, not even, man. No way. And, and, and says, I, I'll, I'll die, man. And pulls out the, sh- the, the sword from the sheath and the rest jump in. And then what happens from that point? Then the Lord rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, you know, Satan. It's like, whoa, what happened to the spiritual wisdom? So he went from being this uber mature Christian and then in, in a nanosecond basically went to uber immaturity, just like that. And so that's a warning to us. And this is Peter, Petros, the rock, you know? And, and, and it's like he went from maturity to immaturity in a nanosecond, and it can happen to us as well. One moment, you're, you're, you're sharing in maturity, thinking maturity, acting in maturity, and then all of a sudden the enemy drops on you something that knows how to push and press your buttons, and boom, you slide right into childlike behavior and immaturity and you lose sight of spiritual wisdom. And so it's a warning to us. This is a, a, a warning to the church today and to us this morning that we need to pay attention and, and be aware that at any given moment we can have those shortcomings. So let's dig in here <coughs> in verse 1 in chapter 3 of, of uh, 1 Corinthians. It says, And I... Brethren, so it's a continuation right of the letter. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men. So he begins to to give us an indication of of uh, you know because you have to take into the proper context the introduction of setting things straight amongst the believers there in Corinth regarding not to be so high and mighty about themselves. To put them on the same level playing field as far as gifts, as far as the grace of God and the centrality of Jesus Christ that all flows in and through Christ and without Christ we're nothing. Not to put people on pedestals, not to think themselves more than they ought and so on and so forth. And so he set that, that was that that was, was the foundation and now he goes into why he can't speak to them in, in a much higher level. And he, and he says that, brethren, uh, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ, as babes in Christ. So right here, what we see right off the bat, what Paul is really saying, he's, he's you know, if it was in a modern vernacular, he'd be saying, you guys lack spiritual wisdom, spiritual maturity. Spiritual growth, I don't see it. This is, this is a bad thing. 
You aren't being filled with the Holy Spirit. You aren't being led by the Holy Spirit. So they lack spiritual growth. And we see two major reasons why or, or how he identifies this, the things that he observed. Because you remember, you know, we'll, and we'll look into this a little bit later on, but remember, Paul established this church. He established this church. This was basically his spiritual baby. He spent time with them. And so think about this. You know, if, if Paul were to walk in right now, right now, this very moment, you know, of course, that's not going to happen, right? You guys know that, right? But if, if Paul were to walk in right now, Paul or Peter or, you know, you take one of your, uh, for lack of better terms, one of your favorite, you know, apostles from the Bible or even a prophet or so on and so forth, one that you say, you know what, that brother had it going on, man. He really loved God. He really knew the word and he knew how to lay it down. And they walked into the door right now. Even for myself, if I saw Paul all of a sudden creep through and, and grab a seat, I'd probably say like, mm, you know what, this may be what the Lord say, time out, let Paul teach instead. Because he comes from, from just a wealth of, and if especially he said, hey, I'm only going to be here for 10 minutes, right? You're like, well, let's take opportunity and have you teach. I mean, wouldn't you want to be sitting at the feet of someone like Paul and his teachings if he had that opportunity? Well, newsflash, you are. <laughs> Not now, but eventually when we're in heaven. But, but you know, it, it would be an awesome thing because of his pedigree, because of the, the wealth and the knowledge of the Word of God. And so imagine this church had that for 18 months, 18 months to hear Paul teach and then departed and then left, you know, uh, another spiritual brother. And we'll see him later on pop up again. Apollos was then the spiritual brother who basically was like the overseer of the ministry. But for 18 months, he does this, leaves. And then as time passes, a short period of time, not much, not even double digits, <coughs> he gets word through letters that says, this is how they're behaving. What's going on? Well, you know, you would expect, you would expect growth. You expect growth. I mean, look at it from an educational standpoint or anything that you do in life. When you do something repeatedly, you expect growth, don't you? You expect to know more. And then to not only know more, but to apply that that you know more now of, you know, on a consistent basis. And when that individual doesn't, what do you say about them? Man, there's just no maturity. They haven't grown. They haven't learned anything. They keep repeating and doing the same things. When will they what? When will they learn? When will they learn? And so I'm not going to say that this is Paul's attitude or, or his mindset. But as I read this, I personally get frustrated. I, I could sit there and, and, and kind of say, man, Paul, you were truly a brother of patience. Because, you know, this is frustrating. This is very frustrating to put so much work and so much time and so much effort. And then, and then to believe that's like, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's catching on. They're, they're getting it, so on and so forth. And then they hear later on, no, it's quite the opposite. They're actually, you know, in a much worse situation as far as growth-wise than they were before. I'd be like throwing my hands up in the air. It's like, oh my gosh, this is frustrating. But I don't want to be like Moses. <laughs> Moses got frustrated, remember? He got frustrated with the people. He got frustrated with the children. You know, at that point, he was like, these are your people, God. Look at them. They don't grow. They don't learn. They keep whining. They keep complaining. All they want to do is murmuring. And they strikes the rock, and he gets all frustrated. And his, his, his flesh, his own flesh comes out, and it costs him dearly. And so, not just for the church, but also, too, for the church leaders. You know, I shared with you that I taught this in, in Haiti. Went through all the chapters. I believe there's 16 chapters. Went through it all in 16 weeks, but from the perspective as a pastor, from a pastor's perspective. And the best, biggest thing that I show them here is, hey, look, be patient with the flock. If you could extrapolate anything just from this one, you know, from this one verse or for this teaching here from Paul, extrapolate this. Be patient with the flock. Do not get frustrated. Be loving and patient. Don't ever grow tired of pouring into them. Just as Christ is patient with you. You know? And so, but he points out two things that I see here. Number one, or A, 
the, the, the reason for their lack of spiritual growth or the reason they knew that they had uh, the, they were lacking spiritual growth and they were they were actually in, stunned they were being stunted in their growth is they were behaving as men of flesh so you're behaving as men of flesh or in other words like natural men natural men we were once natural men and women how do na- natural men and women be- behave well like the world there, there is no godly order in a natural man there is no godly wisdom in a natural man or woman there, there is none of that there is no spiritual rebirth there is no instructions from heaven coming down into the heart of a natural man or natural woman. There is none of that. And so Paul saying, you're behaving though like that. You're behaving as men of flesh. No spiritual insight. In the Greek, in the, Greek uh, the, the, the word flesh is sarkinos. Sarkinos. Or literally, you're acting carnal. You're acting carnal. A carnal person is one who is dominated by the inclinations of his flesh by the inclinations of his flesh or the idea is a person of weakness of weakness Paul is calling him weak he's he's calling him weak this morning if you're operating by the inclinations of your flesh guess what you're weak you're weak you're weak in the things of the Lord you need to Get strong. You need to man up. You need to woman up, you know, in the things of the Lord. Be strong is the, is the thing that, that the Lord told Joshua. Be, be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Is repeated throughout the whole message of, of Joshua and also too even before that to Moses. Moses to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. But meditate upon the word day and night. And then, and then, and only then, will you be prosperous and have success. But your part is be strong. Don't be a wimpy Christian. Don't, be, don't give over to the inclinations of your flesh and, and be carnal. Be strong. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's not, it, it, it's, it comes with difficulties. You know, the world says only the strong survive. Well, you know, that's, that's the humanism attitude. But we know this, though, that in our weakness, who's our strength? And so Paul almost is playing like a double, a double, you know, a double meaning here for them because ultimately he brings it when he turns around and he says that, they're, he, that they are to be as babes in Christ. You know, that you're as babes in Christ. And so the two things that he makes the observations, like I said, number one, that they act like men of flesh with no spiritual insight, and B, that they're babes in Christ. Or in other words, as though they were brand new Christians. Brand new Christians. This, you know, this type of behavior was understandable and excusable when they first came to faith, but not now. But not now. Look, when we're first when we first come to faith with Jesus Christ, what do we know about the word? Very little. And and what can you expect out of a brand new baby Christian as far as maturity? Very little, you know? I mean, the basics are Jesus loves me, this I know. Okay? That's pretty much the basics. And then, but what's to happen is through Bible study, through prayer, through serving, through fellowship, the, the babe Christian begins to what? Or should begin to grow. Grow in their faith. Grow in their understanding. Paul's saying that's not the case with you, Corinth Church. I speak to you as though men of flesh, number one, and number two, as though babes in Christ, as though you were just born again today. It shouldn't be like that. This is basically a knock against them, but also, too, a wake-up call for them. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Time to wake up. You can't live like that as Christians. You know, like I said, it was acceptable and, and excusable at the beginning, but now here it is, years later, it's just not acceptable anymore, and it's, and it's not excusable. See, too many Christians, we want to say, oh, you know, there's a misunderstanding about grace. There's a misunderstanding about grace. Grace is not a license to do whatever you want and to behave as you want and sin as you want. It's quite the opposite. 
is to is to do away with the flesh, do away with our sin. By how? Through accountability, through accountability, through repentance, through service, through correction. Grace corrects. That when Jesus was pinned to the cross, he was correcting us of our of our wayward ways, our sinful ways. Through grace we are saved. Through correction we are saved. Without the Holy Spirit coming and convicting us of our sin, that is called correction. You are wrong. You are dead in your sins. You must turn from your old ways and turn to Christ if you want to be saved, if you want to be born again. That is a correction. That's what grace does. Grace doesn't say, keep on doing what you're doing. Even though, you know what, you're dead in your sins, even though you're far from God, even though wrath is going to come upon you, that's not grace. That is not grace. And yet, they kind of were mixing it up. They had a little mishmash of both. Because really, that's, that's the, you know who interprets grace like that? The world does. That's the world's interpretation of grace. Oh, let them be as they be, to each his own, let's not judge, you know? Who are you to judge? And, you know, oh, and they love the quote, the, the famous verse, right? Let he who has no sin cast the first stone. And then that's all they know. It's like, okay, do you not want to talk about what else Jesus said and talk about it in the proper context and talk about the, the fact that she did break the law? And, and that there's consequences to her behavior, but yet because of grace, there was a correction that Jesus said, go and sin no more. So clearly she was guilty, but he says, I, I, neither do I condemn you. Because he stayed steadfast to what he said in John 3, that the, the, the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, to do what though? To save, to save the world. But yet those who do not repent are already what? condemned and they don't come to the light because what they don't want their sin their darkness exposed because that's what light does it exposes things you know um, <coughs> if you have a dirty room and, and you don't want to clean it up uh, what's the best thing to do you, you turn off the lights and you close the door no one sees it right <laughs> but the moment someone op- opens it up it exposes its filth and goes like oh my gosh it's like yeah 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 look just keep it closed and, and that's, that's, that's man. Man says, I, I don't want that my, my darkness exposed. But the light exposes it and brings us to a point of correction. That's what grace does. If you love someone, you're going to correct them. That's, that's Jesus' correction, his, that grace correcting us, is something we didn't deserve. And that's what grace is, receiving that which you, you don't deserve. We deserved wrath. But yet he extended grace, correction. He could, you know, God could have said, you know what? You have free will. Do whatever you want. Receive wrath, man. What do I care? But because he loves us, because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to come and correct us through grace by bringing us to the cross. That's the message of the cross. But... They were stuck. Instead of moving on to maturity, they remained spiritually stunted. They were remaining spiritually stunted. That's, that's the problem. That was the problem with the Corinth church. And that's the problem with a lot of Christians. My hope is that, you know, the primary focus of this fellowship is is spiritual growth and maturity. It's not, it's not how many outreaches we could do. It's not how much food we could give away to the hungry. It's not how much clothes we could give out to those that are naked. It, it, it's not any of that. The first and, fri- and primary focus or number one ministry is the Word of God being, uh, being taught for the purpose of spiritual maturity. Or as Pastor Chuck used to say, and it's on recordings, you know, uh, healthy sheep beget healthy sheep is to grow healthy sheep so that's my heart my heart is that you would be growing here spiritually and becoming mature in your walk with the Lord independent of 
the body of Christ, not not attached to necessarily. Corporate corporate study of the Word of God is awesome and is necessary, but independently, you need to be mature on your own, serving the Lord. <coughs> As a pastor, I can't I can't hold your hand. That's not my responsibility. I can help you guide your hand to the Word of God. I could help guide you to, you know, Bible studies. I can guide you to the calendar of how to become more spiritual mature so your your spiritual growth isn't stunted. But I can't do for you. That's not my place. That's not my responsibility. Mine is to teach. It's to teach the Word of God and encourage you in return to do the same on your own. On your own. Being reflective of the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God on your own. I believe firmly that somehow or another, the Corinth church didn't do that. They began doing their own little programs and their own thing, and we know that that's how eventually the divisions came in. There's too many just Sunday Christians. And this is not, look, I, I don't want to fall in the category of on, on a, you know, using Sundays in the pulpit as knocking Christians. Look, we, again, we all have our shortcomings in, with our walk with the Lord. But if it's as a result of that you're not reading the Word and, and allowing the Word of God to get into you and you're not spending time with the Lord in, in, in prayer, come on, guys. That's a big one. That's, that's, that's Christianity 101. We're not talking being involved in massive ministry. We're not talking about that. That's the work part. I'm talking about basic Christianity. The fundamentals 101 is read your Bible, spend time with the Lord, and pray. That's the fundamentals of Christianity. But unfortunately, regretfully, there are. There's too many within the church just like the corn church that were hallelujahing on Sundays, praise the Lord, you know, if they were maybe a little bit on the Pentecostal side, even dancing around or whatever, jumping, it's all good, you know. But once the service was over and Monday rolled around, they went back to the world and the ways of the world. You don't need to raise your hand, but do you know Christians like that? We all do. We all do. And, and, and it's, at times it could be frustrating because really the carnal Christian does more damage to the name of Jesus Christ than anybody else. They're the ones agreeing with the world. They're the ones, you know, not, they don't want to rock the boat, so to speak. They don't want to go against the flow. You know, they think it's more about kumbaya than, than you know, repentance and so on and so forth. And, and their minds begin to think more about uh, utopianism rather than kingdom, kingdom thinking. The king is coming. The king is coming, and he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. And, and so that is the effect of that. I can guarantee you within Corinth, because remember, the, the Corinth itself was loaded with all kinds of of idolatry, you know, as a port. And so they had people coming from all walks of life. It was a, a very multicultural place. Sound familiar? Similar to like the United States of America. We're a very multicultural place. And whenever you see multiculturalism, guess what? You see multiple idols and different gods that are being brought along with them and the lifestyles that go along with it. And also, too, a lot of carnality. Like I said, very much like our nation. Once upon a time, we were very Christ-centered, but because of you know our open arms and so on and so forth, all the different ethnic groups and uh, different cultures came along to the shores or through land and highways and byways, whatever you know, and it, they brought their idols along with them. And slowly but surely, right, the stance in Christ began to diminish. And that's where we're at today. No different. But the point is this. I can guarantee you, just like in the church today, 
those that are, are, are more carnal, they're looking to the world for approval or validation regarding their faith than within the church and the Word of God. And I can guarantee you, just like, just like today, the Corinth church is probably doing the same thing. They're living in carnal, carnality, and I can guarantee you they, were, they, were, they had carnal, worldly friends that weren't Christians that were going, hey, man, you're not like those other Christians. I really like you. And they're like, yeah, you know, you know, it's all about love. You know, you don't, don't, I, I don't want to point out other people's sin because I'm a sinner. T-. And they love them. The world loves that kind of Christian. The kind of Christian, like I said, that just goes with the flow. The world loves that kind of Christian. And that's the type of Christian that they point to generally. And that Christian, they think they're validated. Because, well, you know what? I have a lot of friends. And, and they, all, they all like me. How many of them are Christians? Oh, very few. I don't know about that then. That's kind of a mishmash. I mean, I, I get it. We're to do our best to get along with our neighbors. The Bible teaches that. But somewhere along the road, I can guarantee you've had conversations with them that topics or conversations come up that go against the Word of God and you said nothing. And you stayed silent. Just because you want to be accepted. And then you think that you're doing the work of the Lord. You're being duped, man. It, it, anything, it, Jesus, Jesus made it very clear. If you love mother, father, brother, sister, the chihuahua, you know, the hamster, the, your car, whatever you, you throw, if you love that, them, more than you love me, you have no part. You have no part in this. I came to, Jesus said, I came to bring a sword a, a lot of Christians don't like quoting that that verse, and the world definitely doesn't like quoting that one. But he came to make a clear delineation of who belongs to me and who does not. And it's by obedience and living for him that is a clear fruit and evidence of that. Not just your word, but your lifestyle that goes along with it. The lifestyle. The corn church didn't have that. And so Paul and his love for them addressed that. So we just, just don't want to be the hallelujah Christians on Sunday and the worldly ones on Monday. We want to be consistent through and through. So he says in verse 2 I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you're not able. Because <coughs> not even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. And then again, there goes that term, right? The Greek term for carnality, sarkinos. You're still sar- you're, you're sarkinosed up, man. You're all sarkinosed up. For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are, you are not fleshly, sorry, you are not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? So it's, it's rhetorical. He's basing it upon the fruit, observation, through what's been brought back to him. He's reading, this is going on, this is going on, this is a carnal church. And the proof of that is your divisiveness your strife because when you're acting in a carnal manner because the stem of this is is the whole popularity contest no oh, our man our man our pastor he preaches up a storm man and he's on a plethora of channels and he's on major airwaves and man he's got this mega church he is awesome and then the other side no man our pastor he's he not only speaks Greek, he speaks Latin, backwards and forwards, you know, and, and, and all this other, and it's like, you know, and Paul says, stop it. It's your immaturity. And it's evident because that's what's causing the strife. He's trying to set them straight. It's about spiritual maturity. You guys are still drinking milk. He gets gives that analogy. You know, baby doesn't chew steak, man. Liam's starting to get teeth. He's starting to want. 
hard, solid food. But prior to that, man, man, he can't. It's not, it's not happening, you know? And so, <coughs> spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity. The carnal man can only receive milk. This was an implication of their sad spiritual condition, which led to the divisions by creating camps or schisms, right? Camps or schisms, popularity of who they followed. That's what it boiled down to. Their growth had not changed not one bit from the time he first taught them until the writing of this letter. And when was the first time he taught them? Well, again, it goes back to Acts chapter 18. Read it. Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 18. Paul drifts in, you know, after being rejected by the, by the Jews in the synagogue. And then he comes to Corinth and then uh, meets up with, with a, a brother there and then sets camp. You know where this brother lived? Do you guys remember where this brother lived? He lived next door to the synagogue. Next door to the synagogue. Talk about, talk about boldness. Paul began teaching in the house next door to the synagogue that rejected him that's 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 boldness that would be like us saying "Mm, we'll go sit up next to the catholic church right next door and teach there that's boldness that's right and yet that's what paul did that's what he did and he taught again for 18 months taught the word taught the word schooled them on who the Lord was and you know so on and so forth the purpose of his coming the, the, the what we can expect what they can expect of his return what's going to be happening in the meantime so on and so forth all that pouring into them 18 months of teaching again I say if you had an opportunity to be taught by Paul would you not take that opportunity Absolutely. And do you not think, I would hope that after 18 months of listening to Paul, you would have learned something. <coughs> now, here's the bottom line. Here's, here's, here's all what Paul is, is talking about here. Note this. Your spiritual maturity is revealed and will be evident through your appetite. And I'm not talking about, you know, you want a piece of cheesecake right now, what's been brought, or the donuts that we have. No, through your appetite for the word. The prophet said what? Jeremiah said what? When he found the word of God. I found the word of God. And man, I took that word and I devoured it. He was hungry for the word. He was hungry to hear from the Lord. It's all in your appetite. You know, the carnal Christian has no interest in really learning the truth about the Word of God and being corrected by God. It just, he, they just don't. And look, when, when, I was, when, I was, when I was in my rebellion, yes, I was going to church, but quite frankly, there are certain things I didn't want to hear. The number one thing that I, wa- I didn't want to hear was, you know, that a uh, man shouldn't divorce his wife. That's the first thing I didn't want to hear. Because I was the man who was trying to divorce my wife. The other thing that I didn't want to hear was, is that, you know, you have to forgive those, you know, that have, that have maybe done you wrong or so on and so forth. Because at that time I saw my wife as an enemy. The other thing that I didn't want to hear is that you should obey God no matter what. So uh, I, I grew adept at kind of tuning those things out. But guess what? It got difficult. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. Because that's the crux of, 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 the, of uh, the Word of God for us. Forgiveness, repentance, obedience, right? Is that in that order? Man, I, that, I think I nailed it like that just through the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness, you know, well, really repentance, forgiveness, or forgiveness, repentance, and then obedience. And, I, and, and that didn't sit well with me because, you know, I was like, I, I did my best to just, well... I got this going on over here, Lord, in that area, so that should be good enough. And so I wanted to put it into a compartment and take my marriage and not include it in, as part of the deal at all, at all, you know, and try to make up for it in other areas. It doesn't work that way. 
does not work that way. So I was walking carnally. I was walking carnally. You don't think that I knew already where certain verses and teachings were in the Bible when I would pick up my Bible and read it? You don't think that I purposely would avoid those teachings? Again, I was good at it. But it wasn't until I repented completely, came back to the Lord, that all of a sudden, now I wanted to devour all of the Word of God. The entirety. My appetite changed. My appetite went from, give me milk just so I could get by, basics, Jesus love you, this I know, for the Bible tells you so. You know? And I wanted more. I wanted more. I wanted to grow in my spiritual maturity. My appetite changed. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. I'm not too sure if we we went there last week, but if we did, we're going there again. Hebrews chapter 5. <coughs> Look at verse 10 through 14. It says, mm, yeah. being, being designated by God as, high, as a high priest according to the order of Matilzadek. Mm-mm. Verse 11, concerning him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, but since you have become dull of hearing, for through, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And yes, we did read this last week. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So there's something that happens when you, when you, when you get the word of God in you, and with maturity comes discernment, comes discernment, or 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 better yet, application comes with the maturity and knowing God's word how to apply the word of God properly not just in moments and glimpses of life but daily daily in all facets and in every area of your life did you know you're you're a Christian all the time right I know I'm being facetious but listen a lot of people don't understand that you're a Christian always all the time there is no such thing as a part-time Christian. There is no there is no such thing. You may be disobedient, but guess what? If you're disobedient in one area, you're disobedient, period. You know, I saw a, a, a pastor. He had actually a real cool visual. And I, I was the first one to do what, what he uh, said out loud because he had this, this, this Bible, right? And it was pretty cool. That when he had opened it up to passages that like, because he was teaching on the tickling of the ear and how people are very selective. When he had opened it up to passages that were like, yes, that the Bible would light up. And I was like, how do you do that? And then and the first time he did it, he turned around and he said, I bet you guys are wondering how I did this. Huh? I was like, well, yeah, I am. But it was so cool because he had opened it up to favorable passages and it light up. And it's like, yeah. It's like, you know, he'd, he'd say something like, you know, I'm the head and not the tail. Yeah, love that. He closed it up again, and then he reopened it, and it says, die to flesh, and the Bible wouldn't light up. All right? Like, nah, close it. I want the lit stuff. I want the fun stuff. And, and, and it's like, no, obedience is obedience. Disobedience is disobedience. If you disobey God in one area, you're disobedient, period. There's, there's no negotiating in that. And so consistency is what the Lord is requiring of us. Discipline. You know, the baby Christian, the baby Christian only wants to know Jesus love me. This I know, right? I mentioned that earlier. Baby Christian, oh yeah. And generally, that's all they know. And, and you know what? That's a good thing. Especially, like I said, someone would be born again right now. And they said, but I don't know anything about the Bible. I haven't even, you know, I, I, it's like, oh, whoa, 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 calm down. Listen, baby Christian, all you need to know is this for right now. Jesus loves you. That's all you need to know. For now. Do not be stunted there, though. Come back next Sunday. Get into, right? We tell them. 
get into a good Bible teaching uh, church. If you can, go midweek. And then we, we, we instruct them, go back home. Here's a study starting the Gospel of John. Right away, boom, the feeding begins. But for right now, Jesus loves me. This I know. That's all you need to know, that Jesus loves you. Cool. The mature Christian, though, that's not the case, or it shouldn't be the case. The mature Christian is one, or the mature Christian is the one who uh, sees Jesus, Jesus presently. And not just presently, but also, too, he looks ahead prophetically. Sees him presently, but also, too, sees Jesus ahead prophetically. What's that mean? Well, it means now you understand your purpose and the purpose of why Christ came. And, and your responsibility in all this is not just to sit around and, you know, hold hands with, Jesus loves us, this we know, for the Bible tells us so, and that's it. No, it's to now put feet to that faith and know that Jesus, know that Jesus presently and prophetically. That gives us wisdom. That is a Christian who has insight. That is a Christian who has understanding of the days that we're living in and the age. Right? The baby Christian doesn't know that. I mean, could you imagine? You're a brand new Christian, born again. And the first thing you want to teach him is prophecy? <laughs> you know? I'm like, oh. I mean, I, I, it would kind of be overwhelming for the new Christian. So listen, I know you're just born again. You just sit, receive Jesus Christ. But let's talk about, you know, his establishing the kingdom here on earth and, you know, the, the millennial time. And so they'd be like, what, but, 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 you know, what, what? Oh, oh, overwhelmed. Okay, forget it. Jesus loves you. That's all you need to know for now, right? In time, all of a sudden, those things excite the baby Christian who's taking steps towards maturity and growth and is not stunted in their spiritual growth. I remember as a kid, you know, I got into all kinds of stupid stuff. One of the stupid things I got into was smoking, because smoking was cool, right? People said smoking is cool. I got different degrees of smokers. I'll tell you, after service, you come see me, because I have uh, different types of smokers out there, you know? But I was a smoker who wanted to be the cool smoker. I was the, you know, uh, social smoker. And, and, and so when I got, got into smoking... I had, because it, it was still, I was still probably 17 when I started, and, and you know, you guys know that I smoked marijuana prior to that too, you know, young, at a younger age, which was probably like 8th grade, and you know what was, you know what was one of my biggest fears? And this sounds stupid, and yet, here's how the flesh is. In spite of that fear, I still did it. My biggest fear wasn't necessarily like, a, you know, being high and going to jail or something like that or cigarette smoking, you know, uh, uh, dying of cancer or something like that. My biggest fear was that my growth would be stunted because that's what they used to tell you. Oh, you're a smoke man. You got your, your growth. You, your, your growth would be stunted. And I had that fear. And, and whether it's true or not, didn't matter back then. I believed it to be true. And so when I would smoke, like literally, I'd inhale, and then, and then especially once, especially with cigarettes, I would literally go like this and, and, and try to get the smoke because I'd be puffing hard to try to get all the smoke out after I was done smoking. You're right. You know? It's crazy stuff. Instead of what would have been the better thing to do? Just not smoke. But I wanted to be socially accepted. It was a cool thing to do. But my fear of that, the fear of, of, of being stunted in my growth, my physical growth, <laughs> led me to do ridiculous things. Another ridiculous thing I used to do, I used to hate getting haircuts. Now I just wish I had hair, right? And so, and, and so my mom would take me to force to get my hair cut. Hated it. Oh, man, I'd, I'd, I'd be so mad. So mad because we're talking... You know, 70s. Hair was the thing, man. And she would take me to go get my hair cut, and I'd be so, so mad. The first thing I would do is not talk to my mom. 
The second thing I do when she bring me home, I just march straight to that back room, and there's a sofa back there, and I would, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm even sharing this. I would go and stand on my head because I heard that the blood would flow to your head and make your hair grow, right? Right? You know? And I'd stand there, and the only thing that would happen is I would get a headache. And I'd get up and run to the mirror, and they're like, oh, it didn't grow, you know? <coughs> and we're talking elementary school. Point is, because there is a point to this, the lengths that I would go to to ensure these things, or at least these false things, I didn't want my my physical growth to be stunted, so I tried to get all the tobacco smoke out of my lungs. I, I tated short hair so it'd stand on my head. What lengths will you go to for your spiritual growth not to be stunted? Think about that. If all of a sudden there was a law passed that we spot a Christian out on the street with the Bible, we will sniper you on the spot. Would that keep you in your home? Or would you say, well, I just have to zigzag back and forth, man. Ain't nothing stopping me from going to church, you know? And if I'm hit, I'm hit, you know? I mean, or, or you know, a physical ailment. I mean, there, there's some that suddenly go blind. Would that keep you from, you know, being spiritually mature? A- again, look, you... You go, Pastor, you're being extreme. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Those, those, those are extreme examples. But you know what? Sadly, it takes much less to keep people away from the Word of God. Much less. Oh, you know, the wind's blowing in the wrong direction. Uh, you know, I, we, ah, gosh, I just won't go to church today. Or like, oh, I'm so tired. That book, oh, it's, you know, God wants me to rest. And then the, the Bible doesn't open up. Again, much, there's, there's things that are so many, much less things or reasons that keep Christians from growing spiritually. And then eventually they're stunted in their spiritual growth. And yet if you're to ask that same Christian, hey, man, you know, that same example, law comes, it's against the law. Oh, yeah, I would do anything or die for Jesus. You can't even pick up your Bible now. And there ain't no law like that. So we have to have that mindset that nothing will stand in my way from growing spiritually. Nothing. Nothing and no one. It's about rising above man's way by being steadfast in the ways of the Lord. That's what Paul was teaching in the Corinth church. Look, drop the carnality. Stop it. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We have different marching orders. We're to shine for the Lord. A light. Right? Right? We're, it, it's this, this gospel, this, these teachings are counterculture. They really are. Jesus' teaching goes completely against what is natural to man. You do me wrong, I'll double it. <laughs> Your way, you know. Uh, those in prison. Let them be locked up. But Jesus says, hey, when I was locked up, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. I need to be number one. Jesus says, humble yourself and you'll be exalted. Again, these are these go against the, the natural man. The natural man just wants to be that top individual and, and get as much as they can for themselves. And the goodness that man does do without Christ isn't without Christ because only God is good. And because we're created in His image is that we do good things. There's plenty of people out there doing marvelous, wonderful things for humanity. 
But the only difference is they're not giving glory to God. They humbly kind of like, oh, no, you know, I don't want to. But deep down inside, they're going, yeah, I did it. This is the wonderful work. This is the legacy I leave. No glory goes to God. But for the Christian, that shouldn't be the case. We should be almost anonymous. And, and really, that's where Paul is eventually taking the Corinth church regarding the schisms that they had, the divisions, again, was because of popularity contests. And Paul slowly but surely is bringing to that point that says we're really should be almost anonymous or autonomous or whatever term you want to use in our in our serving. Not that we're not nobodies, we're somebody in Christ. But we're not we're not the main somebody. <laughs> we never will be. We never have been. Look at verse four. For when one says I am of Paul and another I am of Apollos are you not mere men? This is rhetorical. Apollos, I mean, sorry. Uh, what then? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Or a, a better way of, of, of uh, phrasing it is like, Paul is basically saying like, okay, some of you say uh, Paul is the, the main man, Paul is the, the main man, but aren't, aren't you men just like us? We're just humans. We're just humans. And, and really, do, do titles really matter? Aren't we just servants? That's a world of servants. What then is Paul's and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So the people, the people God chooses to use are only servants. Servants, he gives us to all believers to bring them to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, in the malls, in the, especially now with the modern technology, you see a lot of uh, automation now. You know, you pick up the phone, prompt this for that, you know. Uh, banks are automated. Even... even um, you know, there's this big push, obviously, in in uh, <coughs> with like like uh, Amazon and UPS and all these other companies. They're going automated. They got machines doing the the work of humans. Well, this here, what Paul is teaching, because you know, when you think about it, on on the on the user end. At times you say, well, I don't really care who's on the other end as long as there's the end result. Whether, you know, so people might pay my bill, they get my package. You know, we've, we've come to the point now where, where, where people, you know, uh, because they're being replaced so much and through automation, we don't give much credence or credit to people. It's just like, bottom line, just get it here. Now they've been talking about you know, drones delivering packages, Okay. And so, in the sense, Paul is kind of saying the same thing here. It's like, don't focus on the person who came. Focus on the message that came with the person. Because when you focus on the person, then you give credence to the person, and you're going to elevate them. That's exactly what's happening. Paul's saying, no, look, we're all servants. Christ Jesus is centrality. Look at it this way as well. You know, in the mall, you guys know I like going to the mall. I'm a mall rat, okay? I own it, like shopping, oh well. And so, in the mall, there's this one jewelry store that has this automated salesperson. You've seen that one, right? Kind of creepy. It's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, whatchamacallit, a hologram or whatever. I don't know what the, the technology behind it, but bottom line is, you know, I play and I sit there and listen to her. You know, I try to chat with her, you know. But of course, she doesn't talk back. She's got a spiel that she gives. Well, kind of thinking like that, even your pastors. You know, it's almost like, don't look at necessarily George the, the person, but just look at George, Pastor George the vessel. And, 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 when, you're, and when you're prepping for church, it's, that's how it should be. It's like, oh, I can't wait to hear Pastor. No, I can't wait to hear from God's Speak through the vessel. 
And you see, then all of a sudden, you're going to be you're going to be less inclined to. Well, this is my favorite pastor. It's like, no, man, I just want to hear the word of God. That should be the attitude. I just want to hear the word of God. I just want good teaching. Whether it's Apollos or whether it's Paul, I don't care. I just want good, solid teaching. That is the bottom line. That is what's important. And so whether it's with someone with the southern draw, y'all, and all this stuff, and the, or, or, you know, or heart accent, you know, whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter as long as it's solid teaching from the Word of God. And then you see how quickly that happens where no longer you get clicks. It's just, boom, it's done. I think that's the beauty of God taking out pastors suddenly. He loves shaking things up like that. Because if not, we get too cozy with a certain teacher, and then, you know, you even see church, I mentioned this before, church attendance, sometimes the big churches goes like that. A pastor now says, I won't be here next week. And then half the church is gone the following week. Like, what's up with that? Or vice versa, they say, but so-and-so will be here. And then there's no room in the church because, you know, you got added people coming to listen to that particular pastor. Shouldn't be that way. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, there is no doubt that there should be revelation through inspiration from a pastor. If I'm just if I just came here and all I did was read, I read to you the whole chapter, and that's all I did, and then said, well, "Let's pray," and that was the message. I just wasted your time. You could do that at home, <laughs> you know, just read your Bible at home. But there needs to be inspiration through revelation. I'm not up here teaching something new, but there needs to be. Inspiration through revelation as far as clicking to you, maybe it may be new. See the difference? But it's again, it's through the anticipation that one must have prior to coming to church or a Bible study that says, I anticipate to hear from God through whoever, whomever God chooses to raise up as the vessel of the deliverance of that message. So, Paul brings up himself and, and Apollos because, you know, again, going back in the, the proper context, look at, look at Apollos' humble beginnings. Acts, back to Acts 18 and verses 24 to 26. He was really uh, inadequate in spiritual understanding. When, when uh, Aquila and Pris- Priscilla and Aquila took a man and said, notice right away, hmm, something's off. Loves Jesus, but something's missing, right? And they began to school him properly. Because he was, I think, under the teaching of John the Baptist, or, you know, and didn't have the born-again experience of the Holy Spirit. And, and so they took him, they schooled him. And so it's like, for those of you who say, oh, Paulus is a man. They said, well, he wasn't always the man, you know? He was someone who was spiritually inadequate. Again, get your eyes off of man. Put him on the Lord. And then here, Paul Paul wasn't trying to do anything other than just say, hey, we're, we're fellow vatos in serving the Lord, you know? That's it. We're fellow servants. Paul, I, Paul didn't see Apollos as a rival. He said this is a competition. He said, we're fellow servants, fellow servants. To Paul, that was a privilege. It was a privilege. He would get all fired up, you know, in Ephesians chapter 3 and in Colossians chapter 1. He'd get all fired up about saying, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a minister of the Word of God. This is so cool. I get to. This is a privilege. I get to minister to you the Word of God. Man, crazy. Think about it. As a pastor, I'm here representing the creator of the heavens and the universe and sharing his word. Me, me, Mr. Mortal Flesh, with faults and defects and so on and so forth, he's entrusted us with his greatest possession, first Christ and then his word. And, and it's one and the same because the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. 
And he says, here, take care of it, man. Be, be the, the disseminators of the word of truth. Are you serious, God? Us? Man, that's humbling. What a privilege. So verse 6. I, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who was, nor the one who waters is anything, is anything but God who causes the growth. So again, he goes on with that whole vein of, of listen, it's not a competition, it's not about man, it's about God. As a matter of fact, not only is he not at a competition, but Apollos and I, we're actually, we're intertwined. We're, we work in harmony. You should too. The church is a living organism that works together, remember? Christ is the head, we're the body, different body parts. There's not one body part that's more important than others. There's actually those body parts that aren't seen, that are vital, seven vital organs. Your brain stops, you're dead. Your heart stops, you're dead. Your lungs stop, you're dead, you know? Kidney stops, you're dead. It's like, I find it fascinating that there's seven, which is, what's the number seven in the Bible? The number of completion. Coincidence? I don't think so. Because without one, you ain't complete. You're dead. <laughs> That's what you are. You ain't complete. You're dead. Lose an arm, keep going. You know, as long as it stops the bleeding, right? Lose a leg, same there. Lose an eye, hey, get a patch. You know, so on and so forth. But you lose any of those seven vital organs that complete you, you're dead. You're dead. So it's harmony. It's Paul saying we need each other. And, and it was, a, a, like I said, a partnership, not a rivalry, but neither is of any use without, all, without the all-important and indispensable blessing of God. Look at the final verses. Now he, he, who, is, he who plants and he who waters are one. But... Each will receive his own reward according to, to his own labor. Not going to get too much into that today because that's a whole other study. But there's rewards, obviously, for, for believers. And, and it implies here that guess what? There's, there's a measure of accountability, a high measure, for what we do in the name of Jesus. For we are God's fellow workers. So not only do we work together, but we're in partnership with God. You are God's field, God's building. And so we'll end here as far as the text-wise. But we are all involved in the building of God's church. And that is what we are to, that is what we are to be examined upon. In other words, the stuff done, sown in the flesh, like I said, we'll eventually get into that, how it's going to burn. Because it's going to be a testing through fire. And the only thing that remains is going to be what you did in the name of Jesus. That's the only thing that's going to stand. Now, Paul emphasizes that by the two terms that he says, your field, or two descriptions, your field and your building to God. Field implies, it, field implies that there is an expected what? An expected return. A harvest. We are God's field. He sows into us. And guess what? God expects a return. And then also too, the term building. You're God's field and God's building. Which the building implies that there's been a, a, a work done. It implies a work has been put in. There's work being done. Both Both ways. You know, a building doesn't just all of a sudden rise up on its own, does it? That's ridiculous. Work has to be put in. Thought has to be put into it. Structure, rooms, this, that, the other. And, and God puts in the work and He builds us up. He builds us up. So a field and a building, but both imply that, you know what? They're to be used and something comes out of it. Something comes out of it. 
And that's Paul's ultimate message here. Again, he's constantly bringing the, the core in the church and bringing us to the centrality of Christ and who ultimately is the most important figure out of all this, Jesus Christ himself. Without our eyes upon Jesus, our spiritual growth gets stunted and we grow stagnant. And then all you want is the mimis, the bibi, you know, the milk. Just give me milk. All the rest of the stuff is too much. It requires too much work. I don't want to eat. No, oh, people get mad or, you know, that requires this or I don't have time. Okay, baby, here you go. You're saved. But man, you could be so much more in Christ Jesus if you just buckle down and, and, and be about your father's business. Amen? Let's pray.